Our Lady of Akita. When did it happen? What is it about? And more importantly, how does it relate to Our Lady of Fatima and the Threefold Secret? Uh, today with me is Timothy Gordon, and we're going to discuss Our Lady of Fatima and Our Lady of Akita and see if we can bring some more clarity about the third secret of Fatima based on what we see in Our Lady of Akita, because we know that Cardinal Ratzinger reported that the message of Our Lady of Akita in Japan is the same as that of the third secret. So we're going to be doing some compare and contrast and bring some light to it. Timothy Gordon, my co-host, welcome back. Give us some facts on mm -hmm. Our Lady of Akita for people who have never heard of it. First fact, it's a great apparition for the building of personal faith and, uh, you know, the, the continuation of, of the personal faith and, and for anybody interested in Marian apparitions, this is a key one that gets overlooked some or traditionally historically has been overlooked some. It's, it's getting a little more of it to do, uh, I would say in the last couple of years. So I like that much. The seer in the case of Our Lady of Akita is a Japanese nun named Sister Agnes Sasagawa. Sister Agnes um, was, uh, was deaf at the time that the, the, the trifold apparitions began. They began in 1973 in the summer. Um, she was deaf. She'd been deaf in one ear her whole life, I think her left ear. Uh, she began going deaf in her right ear, close by. Argue. Some people say related to the apparitions themselves. Other people say no. But before July 6th, 1973, which was the date of the first apparition at Akita, she was deaf in both, both ears. That much is certified. And ended up, and she'd been to Lourdes, which is interesting, um, and had, had tried Lourdes and she, with, with uh, some measure of success for her deafness. But um, so the reason that her personal, uh, you know, physical limitations play into this is because she received a uh, temporary grace from Our Lady uh, of, of healing. Uh, nevertheless, so she was, uh, she was a converted Buddhist. She's from a Buddhist family, a uh, Japanese family, and really, really, uh, particularly many of them are, all of them are really, but, uh, but a beautiful example of a convert to Christianity, or as you, you contrast Sister Agnes with Sister Lucy from Fatima. And, uh, you know, Sister Lucy was just what you would look at as a great cradle Catholic, right? right. An ideal cradle Catholic. Sister Agnes is a great convert and a, a beautiful, be, just a beautiful story. Anytime I look into her, her biographical information a, a little bit. In the case of, um, Akita, though, uh, this is the last bit of setup I'll give, I'll kick it back to you, is the, the interesting thing here is it's not like a, a illuminatory uh, vision or anything like that, like at, at Fatima. It's a physical object. It's a wooden Japanese-styled statue of the Madonna, and uh, that, that's where the locutions were coming from, and, and that's where the message, the three part message came from. So it's, it's really, it's a different one. It's, it's like the Japanese version. It's like, have you ever seen the ring? You know, the horror movie, we'll look at its uh, Japanese counterpart, Ringu. You know, this is the, the Japanese counterpart to Fatima. Lots of, lots of, there's a lot here too. There's a lot to unpack. Yeah. yeah. I had never really heard of it. Um, and what sparked my interest was the the message of Our Lady of Akita that prophesies that bishops will be against bishops. Yes. And we'll talk about that later in the show, um, because we've kind of seen that happening, this de facto schism in the Catholic Church, really since the 1970s, post-Vatican yes. II. And so it's interesting to see that this apparition happens in 1973, and it relates to a, not just something that's apocalyptic, but to schism, apostasy, heresy in the church, and the hierarchy quarreling. Yeah. So, so it's kind of a big deal. And it's, you know, it's way out east. It's in, it's in Japan. 
And I'll put a, a picture of Our Lady of Akita there on the screen so everybody can see uh, what we're talking about. And you can you can see the Our Lady of Akita. It, it, it is Asiatic. Um, and I'm also going to add to this, too. I'm not a huge... Um, I am a huge Marian apparition fan. I love Fatima, Lourdes, Guadalupe. Been there twice. Uh, got the mug. But generally, when it comes to, to Marian apparitions, I'm a skeptic. If they're not if they're not approved and they're not on the church's calendar, I really have no time for them. I'm like, let's read the Bible, let's read Thomas Aquinas, let's go read Augustine, Church Fathers, Cappadocian Fathers. We have all the stuff that we know is legit, and it's going to take me 80 years to to read and understand Digest. and study. Yeah. So why yeah. would I go and chase chase some Marian apparition that came out last year in such and such right. a place? You could waste precious time studying right. a false prophecy. So. I just want to say that I'm generally a skeptic and I would encourage other people to, to take that position. But as I read Our Lady of Akita and I see the approvals, uh, maybe I should just mention those real quick, Tim, before we move on. I think so. Yeah. yeah just, just so people don't turn this off as crazy. Oh, let's see. So it was first consulted and, and proposed in 1975. And in 1984, it was declared that it didn't have any elements which are contrary to the Catholic faith. That was the local bishop and a number of other statements, uh, basically stating that mm -hmm. this is a private revelation that is, it's not a public revelation, it's a private revelation um, that's worthy of our attention. Yeah. Again, this is not dogma. You as a Catholic are not required to believe in this. It's a private revelation. Uh, but there's there's nothing sketchy, you know. Sister Agnes, you know, wasn't a wasn't you know getting rich off of this, or you know, there wasn't disobedience and things you see like in Mechagori or anything like that. This all looks like holy people seeing holy things, talking about holy things for the edification of other believers. So that's right. I give it a thumbs up. That's right. And, and, and Cardinal Ratzinger did as well when he was in charge of the, yeah. the Holy Office. Ratzinger's a fan. Yeah. And yeah, so that, that's really important. Uh, on the other Marian apparitions, the non-approved ones, you're going to get at least, you know, six or eight people in the comm boxes or 30. energized or, or, or 30, uh, you know, angry. Why, why don't you accept you know, whatever, Our Lady right. of All Nations, a blessed Catherine right. Emmerich or whatever. We're not saying they're false, right? It's just, there's, uh, I like Dr. Marshall's point about there's only so much time in the day. And so when one consults Marian apparitions as a source of sort of borrowed faith, right? Because that's right. what we're doing. That's what a private revelation is. We're borrowing against this like gift that. given to the seer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, you, we, we have to, we have to use only the highest, most soundly vetted ones. And, and, and Akita, there used to be people in the eighties that would try to challenge its credibility. It is beyond reproach as it turns out. That's why we're, that's why we're dealing with it. We're not saying that every non-approved apparition, uh, is fake. They might be real, but they're not really worth your belief until verify. Trust yet verify as Reagan Right. famously said right so right. it's it's not that it's just it's a very it's a philosophical verification problem they might be real but they're only valuable after we know they're real precisely and, and in the valid and authentic marian apparitions uh the blessed virgin mary or if it's another saint or christ always always ask the seer to verify the the vision or the message with the local ordinary with the church Right. So our lady never comes down and says, hey, let's rebel against the hierarchy. Let's take over. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, even at Fatima, we don't see that, which is one of the most hardcore ones, you know. So, uh, again, I think I think we're on we're on solid ground here. So should we let's take a look at the messages, shall we? Let's. Sure. OK, so you got the first one there, Tim. <laughs> Uh, like word word for word, the first message I think is less. It's it's an interesting structure because well, I, it's I've less. got it. I've got it. Let me let me. That will be okay. Yeah. Uh, it's basically the very similar to what Our Lady says in the first Secret of Fatima. That's what's interesting right. too about this is they they right. they parallel 
the three secrets of Fatima. So the first secret of Fatima right. was the vision of hell, basically pray the rosary, do right. acts of penance. And here in Akita, she says, pray very pray much the, the prayers of the rosary. I alone am able still to save you from the calamities which approach. So it's a, it's a salvation and it's a pray the rosary message. Which is an interesting feature. I, I alone am able to save you from the calamities. Again, pray, pray to Jesus through Mary. Um, this, this is Our Lady, uh, you know, Mediatrix of all graces and, and you know, the, the meekest woman on earth. And, and you see this time and time again throughout the scriptures. This is her claiming herself in a superlative equipoise, right? This is her saying, I am the most at something. I am the most able at this point. I, and in fact, I'm uniquely able at this point to offer you help with regard to my son. So I, I think that that sticks out, um, not in, a, in terms of contradiction, but just in terms of being a superlative. She is, remember what you're always saying, she leads with hell in Fatima, that means something, that means something, that means something, which it does. Uh, I think this means something here that we are now, whatever it is, uh, you know, 46, 56 years after Fatima. And we have Our Lady like, all right, you didn't, basically I read it as you didn't listen to me. Whereas before the father was angry and my son wants this. Now she's saying, it, it almost sounds like they're more angry or now even the son's angry. Now you have to go, you're, you're relying on me in an even more, uh, uh, you know, prime way. I know that there's, it's, I'm surprised in the comments of all the Protestants who are watching our videos, Tim, and I, having been a Protestant, I know that this is going to make their hair stand on end because yeah. we have language which seems soteriological, salvation-based, and Our Lady is placing herself as the subject, the one to save. And so right. I want to camp out on that just a moment to explain what that means because people I think could freak out about this. And even, even Catholics could say, well, wait a second. Uh, our lady is, I'm still able to save you from the calamities, which approach. Isn't that the role of God? So of course we don't believe Mary is God or a goddess. We believe she's a human. She is the highest human, but she is the means by which Jesus enters the world. And Jesus didn't just put her off after she delivered him. He included her as part of his sacred ministry all the way to the cross. Remember, she stood there. The apostles, except for John, ran away. Mary is there praying, and she knows her son is the son of God, and she knows that he's innocent, that he's sinless. And so in this moment, she knows that he's making a Passover sacrifice for us. Right. And she's okay with that, even though it hurts her. So she's right. brought into this, this mystery, and she's there at Pentecost, again, praying with the apostles when the Holy Spirit comes down. So she's, she's quietly present at all the key moments of the actions of our salvation. And so that's right. why, you know, the church fathers will talk about, you know, and use language like mediation, intercession, and even salvation. Right. Because, look, if Jesus didn't have body and blood. He just, it was like the logos hovering in front of a cross that does nothing. Yeah. Salvation. It contradicts, it contradicts the point of the incarnation. Yes. The point, the very, it, 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 in a certain sense, it props up one of the forms of Arianism, monophysitism, right? If Jesus was just a hovering logo spirit thing without a body, then without a body, then that's not, that's not the embodied second person of the blessed Trinity. The whole point Protestants out there, which you always miss, is that for Jesus to be fully incarnate as fully man, you guys accept the, the Council of Nicaea as much as we do, basically. Um, he's fully God and fully man. That means he has a, a, a fully human mother that was requisite. And, these, and they'll say, well, yeah, yeah, but she's not the mother of God. She's the mother of man. Yes, no. except those two natures are, what, what are the other councils right around yeah. uh, Chalcedon? Um, they're inseparable. Yeah, they're because united. They're, 
there, because his two natures are there, which no one dickers with, no Christians dicker with, and then they're united, that unites and solidifies Mary's role as uh, the mother of as God. Mother, and so she she's soteriolo- She's a soteriological sine qua non. Yes, because she is needed uh, in order for him to become an ensouled body, like a human body, yeah. like us. Um, yeah. And his ontological connection with all of humanity and you and me and everybody watching, he is connected in his humanity to us through Mary. Right. 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 I mean, God could have just, you know, gone into the garden somewhere and formed a human body and made Christ incarnate in that body. Right. But that human, that humanness that God created out of a second time, if he did, hypothetical would not be genetically connected to any of us. It'd be a new, a new thing. So God in his wisdom, he derived the humanity of Jesus. He assumed it through the Virgin Mary from the Virgin Mary. Right. The, The heretic Valentinius in the early church, he said that Jesus came to us through Mary, like a straw, like a straw you drink through. So he just kind of passed through like a tunnel. But the Catholics said, no, Jesus actually was born X from the Virgin Mary. He derived his humanity from her DNA, from her right. egg, from her flesh. Right. He looked like the Virgin Mary. So that's what we're saying here. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a passage in Scripture where St. Paul says <laughs> that, you know, he becomes all things to all men so that he might save some. Now, if Paul... The apostle, who is very Christ-centered, says that he can save some. Why wouldn't even more so the Blessed Virgin Mary be able to say that? Even preachers or priests could say, yes, through the sacraments, I save people. Or through my preaching, I save people. Or people were saved at you know, our meeting or whatever. We can say that, but we don't mean it in an absolute way. We mean it in a relative way. We mean right. God used me as an instrument to bring his salvation to another person. What is the greatest instrument that God has ever used to bring salvation to planet earth? The blessed Virgin Mary. Like you said, she's the sine qua non. Yes. We don't mean it. We only would mean it in when we speak of the Godhead in a primary immediate sense, but in a secondary immediate sense, yes. Evangelize even effective evangelization, which you're pointing out with St. Paul is you and going, Hey, did, did you, did you save that guy? Yeah. I mean, or a priest hearing a confession, right? He could say that he is saving people. He's, you know, he's bringing them out of sin, out of hell. He's kind of doing both because he's doing, he's acting in personum Christi. Mm -hmm. Right. So that would be the primary sense. And then him as a man being like, I want to pull in extra hours with his own goodwill. I want to do extra confessions tonight. So I get into my, into personum Christi extra hours tonight that's the secondary sense that's his yeah that, that's an interesting concept but i mean the, the the precise reason i like where you're going with this dr marshall the precise reason that evangelical american protestants have been very good at being evangelical which gives them part of their titular now I, i'm not sure if they how much they own it but they're called evangelical because they're good at evangelization and because they believe we need to go out and save souls. Yes. This, this is, this is God's action, but it comes through the vehicle of you and your goodwill. This is true at a higher level with Mary. It's just not that complicated. You know, if you save someone who is drowning, then it's, it's the same context, right? It's really the Lord who wishes all good things. That is the, the formal and final cause of that good action. But, but it's, it's still fine for you to say, hey, I got a medal. I jumped in and I saved someone from this, from this uh, steam, steamboat wreck, like in Huck Finn. Yep. You know, like that's, that's not misleading to say. You just we don't always speak in terms of ontological primacy, which gets it's deeper, but it's confusing and it doesn't attach to everyday life more. So Mary is being just direct and speaking in the everyday secondary sense, which is how most people speak. I am still able to save you from the calamities with which approach I alone. 
yeah. she's, she doesn't mean I alone with respect to God. She means I alone with respect to yeah. the, the, the calamities. Humans. Yeah, the calamities. You yeah. know, an analogy that helps us understand this is when it comes to Christmas time, my kids want to get gifts for their mom, my wife, Joy. Right. And so I take them to the store. I pull out the money, right? <laughs> I bring it home. I wrap it. I put the tag on it. And then for the little ones, I write their name on there from Elizabeth. And then on Christmas morning, they walk over super excited and hand the gift to my wife, Joy, and say, I got you a present, Mommy. And she opens mm -hmm. it and she gets the hug. Well, you know, is it true that Elizabeth got her a present? Absolutely, it is true. But all the causality, except for the little instrumental part of carrying it over to the mother, was me. That's right. <laughs> I that's drove right. there. I paid for it. I so I did all the work. And that's very much in the economy of grace, how things work in salvation. God chooses to use his little infants, his little children, to bring messages of salvation to one another in a big way through the sacraments, in a smaller way, just right. through conversations and friendships. Yeah. And in the Catholic Church, we understand that the, the efficient cause and the final cause is, you know, remotely, it is God always. But God loves to use instrumental causality. He loves to use people as instruments. That's just who he is. He could, he could save everybody directly through an apparition of Jesus Christ that appears in their bedroom at midnight. He could do that to every single person in humanity. He has chosen instead to use human instruments to bring about the message of Jesus to the whole world. And sometimes we do that well, sometimes we do it horribly. But you have examples of St. Patrick. You can say, St. Patrick saved Ireland. Right. We know right. it was Jesus. We know it was the, you know, the Holy Trinity, right? <laughs> you know, and maybe there was a, another missionary there that was helping Patrick. So we know that there's other auxiliary elements to it. But it is accurate to say St. Patrick once saved Ireland. Right. Did he travel there in a boat? Because it was also the boat. It's like, well, yeah, but that's yeah. not how people talk. You don't say St. <laughs> Patrick and his little boat. Who you, you actually could say that. You could say sure. that the captain helped, saved Ireland, if you want. He could say, hey, I was, part, I was part of that team, you know, yeah. part of the Patrick Ireland team. Of course. And in the Catholic Church, we understand that when you lose your car keys and you say, say, Anthony, help me find my car keys. He's not, he's not operating distinct or broken off from the beatific vision. That's right. He's getting the info on the keys and helping you out, we believe, because he's talking to God. He sees God. And in God's right. omniscience, he can see your car keys are under the bed. Incidentally, quick sidebar here. So you don't, you, you said you usually don't have your, your younger kids do the, the crappy, crappy kid rap job. I go with the crappy kid rap job. No, usually. we have crappy kids. Do everything else. See, but here's the deal. I have these twin daughters that are teenagers, and they do everything beautifully. So if there's uh, anything crappy going on, they would come in, and they would just make sure it looks good. Oh, really? Yeah. In fact, that sounds the crappy rap like job it. is actually me. I usually yeah. do the crappy rap job. <laughs> I, I can handle the kitty crappy rap job. Right, I, I right. got that long. Yeah. Well, you're, you just, see, you're just adding more of, of of their own instrumentality into the process, which is good. Right. very divine-like of you to do that. That's what I'm trying to do. Okay, so that's the first message. Uh, we had a lot to say over two sentences. And then, of course, pray the rosary. Uh, you know, the rosary is the gospel on beads. The most important part of the rosary is not saying the Our Father or the Hail Mary, the Glory Be. It's the meditation on the mysteries. Yeah. You know, it's, it's meditating on, you know, Christ in the garden, praying, sweat, drops of blood, scourging at the pillar, crowning with thorns, carrying the cross, crucified. Like, spending 15, 20 minutes just camping out in these mysteries changes your heart and your mind makes you a better disciple of Jesus Christ. And so the rosary is a form of, of if you want to use modern language, guided meditation. And right. your, your guide is the Blessed Virgin Mary, and she's saying, hey, let's walk through what my son went with, or went through, and you be there with him. And you do that every day, it starts to change you. If you do a guided meditation with the rosary, you, you become a better person, you become a saint. And just for the sake of focus, I like to try to, I don't know, this is almost an interesting uh, topic, 
to, to, to open up. I do just cause I've done so many rosaries now over the last two to three years when I've really been trying to do it daily that I, I I'm trying to focus on a detail that I haven't thought about before. So I'm like, yeah, on the Jesus, you know, carries the cross. So I'm trying to think of another character that's covered somewhere in the gospels from whose perspective I can consider it. So yeah. Yeah. It's all about the meditation. Again, another thing yeah. Protestants don't get. Yeah, It's like putting yourself in the movie to use a contemporary way of speaking. Right. right. You're at the, you're at the foot of the cross. And it's like, well, this time I'm going to pretend that I'm John. Right. right. Or this time I'm going to be a centurion or this time I'm going to be a Jewish priest and think about it, how they're experiencing what's going or the, uh, the thief on the cross, you know, so you can kind of play with it in your imagination and interact with Christ from all these different perspectives. And, you know, as a Protestant, uh, before I knew about the rosary, uh, you know, we read the Bible and we knew the stories and all that, but that intimate way of, of interacting with Christ through the scenery, like I said, being in the movie is really helpful. It's really profound. Yes. Okay. So yeah. second message, Tim, should we do that? Let's, let's do it. All right. You got it. Or do you want me to read yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This one, this one makes me laugh a little bit. People bear with me. You know, I, I like to find the humor where it might not have been intended. Our lady says many men in this world afflict the Lord. I desire souls to console him to soften the anger of the heavenly father. I wish with my son, it's that language for souls who will repair by their suffering and their poverty for the sinners and ingrates. Now what there's not really anything funny here and, and I'm a, a weirdo or whatever. I just said, I think it's funny. I just like the opening line, right? Like many men in this world afflict the Lord. So many men piss the Lord off. Is yeah. basically what she said. Many, many men bother my son. Like yeah. you bother me. Yeah. I, I just think it's fun. I think it's kind of a hilarious uh, phraseology. And what? And she means it literally, though. So there's nothing funny about it. It's all the more serious that she means this angry, kind of terse, uh, uh, brusque phraseology. To use a term Pope Benedict would always use. She uses it literally. She's not trying to be funny, so it, it makes it actually unfunny. I, you know. A lot of people that are living right now are, are really, really making my, my son really upset. Yep. That's not good. Things do not, this does not end well, yeah. right? It, without, without close matching of her words, mimicking of what she's saying to do. Yeah, do you, do you think that, uh, again, I'm just, I'm just thinking of skeptics again as I hear these things. Um, so often we hear now that, you know, Jesus is, is tender. He is the mercy, the king of mercy. I believe all those things 100%. But what we don't hear is the expansion of that, that he is merciful in light of justice. In other words, there is a hell, there is damnation, people go there, etc. Jesus doesn't want any of us to go there. So he's doing all these things to ensure our salvation. So again, like we saw in Fatima, we see here, our lady's pretty frank. Doesn't mince words. You know, you might expect Mary to come down, just give everybody hugs. Like, we need hugs. I'm in a hug ministry. Blessed Mother coming down, just giving everybody hugs. No. <laughs> She's or coming. High fives. Or high, high fives. fives. I'm okay. You're yeah. okay. And what we see, I mean, this is the woman, the mother who stood at the foot of the cross and watched her son. Devastated. So she's coming to the world and she's like, we stop afflicting my son, scourging, whipping, spitting on him, punching him, pressing the crown of thorns in his forehead. Will you with please? With your sins. Yeah. Will with you, your sins. Exactly. Will you please knock it off? And she's saying, yes, Jesus is merciful. He's tender, but people are going to hell and men are afflicting him. They are hurting right. him. Will you please just knock it off? Stop. Stop sinning. Can we, yeah, maybe, maybe it would be, um, um, potent at this moment to, to put up that, that meme I sent you. I, I think it's hilarious of the, uh, the high five, oh, yeah. you know, okay, yeah, was, let's put it up on the screen. There it is. It was big a couple of weeks ago with the, the, you know, what you really need is a helping hand, which is in the yeah, so you're drowning. context here. Yeah. You, yeah. You, you're drowning and, and someone just gives you a high five and you go down. <laughs> That's what critics actually want. That's what critics actually want Mary to do. They're like, why doesn't she just high five us as we drown? 
Yeah. No, she's here to tell you. Just spoke to Jesus. He doesn't He's like that. He's not happy. Yeah. He doesn't like this. You're, you're, yeah. you're almost out of luck. This is your last chance, right? Yeah. Like, and, like, and she you, says, like you do with your kids. She says, here's some solutions. Let's fix it. Right. Right. She doesn't say he's really, really mad and you're, you're screwed. screwed. She doesn't say Jinx. that. She's like, he's really mad. Here's, here's what, what to do here. As a matter of fact, this is the, the ground for my apparition here today with you all. So yeah, I think, I think, I, I guess it's difficult to not be a broken record and to be harping on something that at the same time, you know, people are missing in, in popular preaching, yes. popular homiletics. Even, you know, the papal homiletics, they're all they're all missing this. So it's like, yeah, we, we say it a lot. But what, what do you want from us? You know, this is right. This is what you have to do, because people don't understand that mercy does not exist in in contradiction with justice, with God's justice. Jesus is merciful because of with reference to God's justice. He doesn't say I'm going to destroy. Amen. I'm going to I'm going to abolish the game for you. The game is on, baby. Yep. That, that, is that directly from which gospel is that from? The game is on, baby. He's yeah. <laughs> the, the rules are there and, and they're they're there for all of us. And they no one's bigger than the, the moral rules, the Decalogue, the natural law, you know, the, the, the gloss Jesus put on all these things. Um, the mercy and the graces are there to help us win. But he's like my Father in heaven will be paying attention to who is winning and who is losing. There's still a, a dub and there's still an owl yes. that will be accorded to each person. Yes, absolutely love that. And then the, in the end here in the second message, she says, I wish with my son. So we see here as a companion of Jesus, which is great for souls who will repair by their suffering and their poverty, poverty, for the sinners and ingrates. And I was just thinking in my mind, okay, the second message of Fatima was, of course, pray the rosary to penance, but also the consecration of Russia, she asked for, um, and that the Holy Father will suffer many things. So we see this whole idea of making a consecration and also embracing suffering. It's a little loose. I realize it's not a one-to-one, -one, but the theme is still there. Um, I wish with my son. So there's this idea of her being consecrated within or alongside Jesus. And then for souls who are going to volunteer, like Sister Agnes, who receives these, these visions, uh, or these words rather, to suffer and to take on poverty for the sake of sinners and ingrates. I like that. And I think all of us right now, Tim, me, everybody watching or listening through iTunes, however you're consuming this, Am I willing to be one of those people? <clears throat> and it doesn't necessarily mean that you walk through the streets and fog yourselves or you wear a hair shirt 24 seven. If you're a mother, it can be as simple as waking up with the children and tending to them and offering that as a beautiful sacrifice to the Lord. Feeding the hungry, you know, maybe the kids are up at 5 a.m. on Saturday morning and you want to sleep in. You wake up, you make them breakfast, you fed the hungry. I just fed the hungry. Yes. Yeah. You know, that's just for mothers and for dads, you know, the, the going to work and the, and all the things you do for the priests who are like, man, I don't want to go sit in a confession again for three hours, but they do it for love of God. So sometimes in our Catholic imagination, we, we go to the extremes and we think, well, I need to sit on top of a pillar for 90 days or I need to wear a hair shirt. Right. right. Or I need to pray and get the stigmata. And all, some of these, you know, we're talking about, the 0.0001% of what we read in the lives of the saints. But for most of us, it's just doing our daily duties with a spirit of joy and a spirit of sacrifice, spirit of service, and offering those in prayer to Jesus as sacrifices, not only for ourselves, but for other people, you know, for those who need redemption, they need mercy. Yeah, I like the point a lot. It's, it's um, sort of counterintuitive to, to put it this way. While we know that it's true, not everybody, people hopefully are getting into heaven without wearing hair shirts, because I've never owned one, uh, not in years, not since the 70s. Christmas no, idea, owned... Christmas yeah, idea. Yeah. Stephanie, if you're listening, you yeah, want exactly. a hair shirt for Christmas. Please, they're just good <laughs> fashion, people. Um, no, I mean, yeah, so I, I guess I'd never thought about it in the term, in the stark terms, uh, you just spoke about it, Dr. Marshall, like, people better be getting into heaven. 
without wearing the hair shirts and with it was self-flagellation and all of that, because I don't do either of those things and I never have. Um, so it makes the point kind of like a championship basketball team. Like we talk, we tend to talk about, you know, the only winner is the finals MVP, the best player on the winning team. And that's not, that's because we're not socialists, right? It's most interesting to talk about them. Same thing. It's most interesting to talk about the saints, not a couple guys, you know, w- raising their families, wearing regular shirts, well, under armor, right. I guess. Uh, but, but except the rest of the team has a job to do and to discharge the duties of, of your job. Well, even though they're less glorified in, in this sense, it's anti glorification, but even though they're less grabby than the MVP's job, you know, is, is still a, a make it or break it distinction. You still either discharge your suburban or urban or rural duties to your family or to your flock if you're a priest well or unwell and you're judged on the whole. So I, I really I really like what you're saying there with respect to the second part of the secret here. All right, now we get to the the, the juicy stuff. All the all the meat. This is what everybody's waiting. Like, okay, okay, get, get to the bishops against bishops and cardinals against cardinals. That's what we want to talk about. But it's important that we fighting, right? Yeah, yeah. we have to prefer it. We have to we have to go with what our lady said in the order. Because it's kind of like when we get to bishops against bishops, that's what happens when you don't do everything she just said. Yes. Yeah, so, you don't want a proof text just because it's more interesting. Right. It's the same thing I just, same point we just made Yeah. about secret two. Yeah, we got to go in order. That, that's good. Okay, so let's do this. I'm going to read it, and then you just interrupt me on a point you want to make. Okay, so we're, we're doing now the third message of Our Lady of Akita. This is the juicy one, bishops against bishops. It begins like this, quote, My dear daughter, listen well to what I have to say to you. You will inform your superior. I'm going to pause here. Again, Our Lady wants the seers and the visionaries to conform to their superiors. This always Mm -hmm. happens in true apparitions. Consistently. Yes. As I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all of humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge, such as yeah, so one will never have been seen before. Go for it, that, Tim. Do you, do you hear what you say? I mean, this is a valid apparition accepted by the church, worthy of, worthy of belief. And she's saying more than the flood, more than the ark. And then just to underscore the, the emphasis here, to reemphasize, she says, so if you don't know what that means, you know, the flood... Noah's Ark, that was, that was number one before, you know, the, the, the covenant made thereafter was a rainbow that, that they, it's, so it's not going to be a flood. We're going to find out in a couple of lines what this will be, but it's going to be worse than the flood. This is serious business. Yeah. It reminds me of, you know, in the gospels that there's a baptism of water and then there's a baptism of fire. It's almost like Noah's flood the deluge was the baptism of water and here we're talking about the baptism of fire because she goes on to say quote fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity the good as well as the bad sparing neither priests nor faithful oh good so hey priest just because you're a priest you're you're in it man yeah i mean this is kind of like for people that are, are holy, but fear a natural death, uh, uh, way too much for a holy person. This is just a temperament thing. Sometimes I fall in this category. I, I can fall in and out of it, but just because, you know, like a friend of mine, a well-known Catholic would always say like, you know, anxiety is crypto atheism, secret atheism. Cause it means you're not caring about things the way you should. That's, that's catchy. And I, I don't disagree. But when I slip into thinking about natural health, natural death too much, I, I, you know, I don't think it's that I've slipped into crypto atheism. I think it's just a temperamental thing. You know, I, I can get, sure. uh, I can get, I can be a little bit uh, choleric at, at times where I get anxiety. But the point is that this kind of ends the dispute between those of you out there who, who might talk about a natural death, you know, good, good, faithful people. 
as something to fear, something to, you can't avoid it. You already knew that much, but now she's specifically tying it back to soteriology. And what she says in 1973 is specifically that, look, your soteriology, your salvation is tied to your good acts, but but your good acts will not save you from the natural chastisement of, well, actually supernatural chastisement of the third part of the Akita secret. If you're going to, if you're going to, if your number's up, you're going to go. Yeah. Scary. Good and the bad together. Priests, good priests and bad priests together is what she probably meant to say. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And, and then she, and then she says the survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. <laughs> Now, this reminds me of the third secret of Fatima 3A, the part that was revealed, not the part that we don't have, because we see a city, you know, half desolate, bodies everywhere. So remember, folks, Cardinal Ratzinger said that this vision is the same as the third secret of Fatima. And it's at this point where we start to see the overlap. Right. Right. Yeah, exactly. There's something uh, apocalyptic of dead bodies, destruction, truly, truly uh, uh, seems global. Right. Well, a city of ruin, remember to go back to 3A from Fatima, a city that's laying half in waste, which is could describe the Roman Empire anytime after like the fourth century. But but with assassins all around and yes. with dead bodies all around. This sounds like the kind of situation where the survivors might envy the dead and be like, well, this is really bad. I, I almost wish I were dead. Yeah. I sit, now, uh, the, the fire from above, if you'll pardon my you know, gallows laughter, fire from above sounds like you might en envy the dead even a little bit more. You know, if, For if sure. the earth is scorched and heaven, heaven only knows. It's it is it is on on par with three A, but it sounds like a, a an uptick, right? Uh, a, by a distinction of degree, it sounds more. And and by the way, Sister Agnes didn't have access to three A, right? Oh yeah, that's true. Yes, yeah, she true. didn't have when she, when this comes out in seventy three. Three A is released in two thousand. That's true. So so she's not like you know copying or or doing anything you know, that she knows about trying to make her third secret of Akita match the third secret of Fatima. So it's kind of right. neat, you know, post hoke to see, wow, this stuff lines up. And also, since we're pointing out context, that's a good point. I, I'd never really put that little hist uh, historical trivia together. It ends up being important. Also, I believe she was the only member of her Buddhist family to convert. So mm. It's not like you got. It's not like you got this. Oh, Fatima, Akita, Lords, La Salette, from your mom. Like, like she got it from, from her great mom. Aunt. The way many people, yeah, from a great aunt. It's it's all new. It's as new as the gospel is to her. It's as foreign to her a Japanese woman as the gospel would have been. Um, so I That's I don't. A good point. She's not a cradle Catholic. We can say that much certainly. Um, whether or not, whether or not her, the re, anyone other, any other members of her family converted, I, I can't say with certainty. I'm, I'm just going on memory. But yeah, it's, it's a different thing fundamentally for, for an adult convert to be the seer. Uh, I, what it, it's just a, just a hell of a thing. Well, my mind, you know, runs back to Our Lady of Guadalupe. We have Juan Diego. He's an adult convert. He converts later in his life, I think, you know, after his wife even dies. So he's 40s, yes. 50s. I don't know the exact age, but he's a convert and Our Lady yes. chooses him. So, again, not a cradle. His his mind isn't imposed with all kinds of things that he's learned growing up. Just Catholic culture that we, you know, suck in as sponges for kids of all the, the Marian apparitions and the catechisms and all that. Like you said, blank slate, totally new. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, yeah, it so, makes a difference. So the next yeah. part, uh, she says, quote, the only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son. Each day, recite the prayer of the rosary. With the rosary, pray for the Pope, bishops, and priests. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals and bishops against other bishops. I'll pause there. Tim, 
This is the good part. This is the money shot, really. Yeah. I mean, um, I guess to start at the beginning, the sign left by her son could I be the, either be the sign of the cross, mm -hmm. right? The crucifix. It could be. I mean, we wouldn't say if, in the sense of like signs and wonders, what what we used to call the miracles in the gospel could be anything. I always thought of it as the cross. What What do you think it is? Well, I think you know, signum in Latin, like the sign, is either the sign of the cross that we make at every prayer, um, but sometimes it's used for the creed. So it might be the creed or the profession of the faith. I don't know. I mean, I, I think back to how the Japanese for, you know, I think it was over a hundred years, the church existed without priests. So they would just baptize and marry one another and they would recite the creed and recite the rosary because all the, all the missionaries were kicked out of Japan. And so it's like, she says, the only arm which will remain are the rosary and the sign left by my son. So it's almost like in this period, you may not have masses or confirmation or... Huh. Maybe you, I don't even know, you know, it's all you have wow. is the sign and the rosary. I hope that's, I hope, I hope that's, that's not, not right. the case, but yeah, she's saying Maybe it is. your, your tool belt is greatly restricted, but she right. says, pray the rosary. And she says, pray the rosary for the Pope, the bishops and the priests, the work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church. Now, smoke now, of Satan. Smoke of Satan. Now that that a similar parsing of an almost identical phrase had been selected and used not a full year before this by Pope Paul the Sixth. Remember, in late 1972, when he says, "By some fissure, the smoke of Satan has entered the sanctuary." Strange. Everyone's getting the point. Now, this is three years after the new mass has been released. Make yep. of that what you will. Eight, eight years after Vatican II closes. <clears throat> eight years after the close of Vatican II. All of the funny business, I mean this in the most serious sense, ironically, in terms of what happened between the close of the Second Vatican Council in 1965 and the actual release of the new mass. Think of how many, how much... Uh, uh, chicanery subterfuge was happening in those five years, right? In those five years between 65 and 70, you have uh, Louis Bouillet and Cardinal Ratzinger, two friends who had been on the concilium to write the new mass from the, the council document, Sacrosanctum Concilium, coming forward and telling Pope Paul VI, Holiness, this guy you put in charge of the concilium Bunini, he's he's whack. Everyone look yep. him up out there. He's totally he's totally bonkers. Maybe a Freemason. He's going off the rails. Maybe a Freemason, which it, it ends up looking like he was the guy that wrote the Novus Ordo. Uh, and we have to leave. This is such a, a personal moral crisis. If you if you don't remove him, then we remove ourselves. So they they left the Concilium. I don't um, like that, Tim. It reminds me of Ratzinger many years later. It, it is shades of. Yeah, I don't like what's going on. I'm out. Right, right. I, I, at no, this point, I think we got to be in there and, and, and throw some elbows and, and f win it back. We can't no, just be like those darn, it's kind of like, you know, we talked about it, Halloween and, and Holy Days. We can't just let the pagans have it and be like, well, I don't like how you're doing that. I'm leaving it. No, people. Like we no. said, be the Maccabee. <laughs> Organize your men, go back and take it. It definitely ain't the, the Gordon Marshall way, right? If this That's were right. instead of Ratzinger, uh, Ratzinger Bouillet, oh, I also respect Louis Bouillet, but, but same, same critique of, of his uh, parallel action. Or Gordon Marshall, I think, I think now with a little bit of history, we know, okay, what you have to do is stay and fight. Um, and I mean, Benedict should have known it by 2013. But then he might have felt it because they went and they started the, um, um, uh, Communio, right? Yep. They went and started a new journal, and they were the, so they. It was a little bit less like pure retreat. I pro, I think staying and fighting is is now. It's more clear that's what's needed. But they went and they started like an alternate journal, and they kind of worked against from outside. So it's it's arguably, yeah, it's not as good. I agree with you. Yeah. But nevertheless, this is one of the things that people don't understand. The one of you know the Pope Benedict, who knows what's going on right now more than anyone. He's not doesn't have the mind of God, but he, he knows where the bodies are buried. 
He knows why he, he resigned. He knows whether or not, you know, he alone can verify whether Vigano is speaking the truth. He knows that document on the Lavender Mafia. He knows who the Freemasons are in the Vatican. He knows all of the funniness that happened in the late 70s and early 80s. He knows about Fatima. Yeah. He knows everything. And and he was in this position and 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 this happened. It's, it's one of the minor facts, him and Bouye leaving the uh, uh, concilium that I think people need to know about. It's easy to overlook. Also, between 65 and 70, you get the rogues getting communion in the hand. You yes. get the... You get the the removal of the oath against modernism right before the mass was released in 1969. Uh, Pope Paul VI re- took away the oath against modernism in all the universities and seminaries. That's that's odd. You get the it you is. get the, uh, the removal of the Saint Michael's prayer at the for the new mass. You know, at the end, you, which is a mini exorcism every time. You you had the one loss to the libs in the church was. 1968 and, and humanae vitae. But, um, even that was, was he, you know, there were so many other victories afoot for the liberals in the church that they, they felt like they could openly rebel and they, yeah. they basically have ever since then. And they never really followed it without any kind of punishment. So it wasn't a pure loss for them because they had a sizable enough majority not to fall. So all this is happening and then and then what happens after the new mass is released between 1970 and 72 people just the faith is gutted right people stop going to church 50 to 60 yeah, percent of I'll people put, i'll put the graph on the screen look at this folks look at what happens between 1965 and 1975 look at the look at the young people how quickly they abandon the catholic church no more people going to mass it's 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 so sad. We've talked about this before. It's like when Coca-Cola put out New Coke and everybody hated it, they didn't just say, New Coke's better, New Coke's better for 50 years. They right. said, oh, we should go back to our old ways because that's what people liked. Look, right. at this num- look at these numbers. Look at this graph. It's right. crazy. So, yeah, I, I like how you kind of published this timeline, Tim. In like 1970, we have the, the Novus Ordo of the Mass. Um, that was the same. Start. That was the same year, by the way, that the Society of Saint Pius X started with church approval under right. Archbishop Lefebvre. Everybody always thinks of SSPX as you know excommunicated, but they were around for years with approval of Rome as a a priestly society. So that happened in 1970 as well. Um, in 1972, Paul VI abolished minor orders. Oh yeah, which was a big thing in the in the uh, seminaries, and I then in seventy three we had the invention of Eucharistic lay ministers of Holy Communion. So you had oh that la- was seventy three. Yeah, so you had lay people actually touching the Eucharist for the first time. Oh, was, I thought that happened before seventy. I just always assumed that's no, interesting. nineteen seventy three. That's so that's the same year as the Akita visions that we're talking about. And then uh, 77, although it was happening in like Belgium and in Holland and Germany, communion in the hand, it came to America in 1977. So before that, we had communion on the tongue. 1977. Right. We uh, also also in the secular world, 1973 is the year of Roe versus Wade. That that can't have made Jesus very happy yeah. for, for us. But we're the light of the world, right? I mean, that, that's the leading nation in, in the world in terms of moral, moral prowess. And um, that, I don't that's, know. <laughs> well, not I mean, leading well, in, I in good morals and bad morals nowadays. Yeah. Well, I mean, up until that point. Right. I mean, this is just the it's the, the first world nation of first world nations at that point. And that's really when we handed in our, our badge. Yeah. With 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 Roe versus Wade. Wow. I didn't know some of that other stuff. Yeah, we should uh, maybe do a video. Uh, let us know in the comments. Do you want us to do a video of timeline? I think it'd be really good to do a timeline from, you know, just go through dates from maybe 19, from like uh, maybe Leo the 13th. That'd be good. All the way up to our present day of just of, of changes and modifications in the College of Cardinals, liturgy, divine office, just to see how we went from in, a, in the past hundred years, so much change and where all that happened. So let us know in the comments. You want us to do that? We'll do it. That'd be a video where less commentary, I think, would be requisite because yes. res ipsa loquitur, right? The, the facts speak for themselves. Exactly. It's like, yeah, boom, here's, here's what's happened in the last hundred years. I, I think we should do that. 
Yeah. Categorically. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right. So moving on. So we have uh, Cardinals opposing Cardinals, Bishops against Bishops. I mean, we should say something here, Tim. I mean, I, there were Cardinals opposing each other at Vatican II. We know that. Um, we know that bishops were also having words with one another over the mass. You see that with Lefebvre. Lefebvre has deep concerns. Um, he originally had a lot of sympathy within parts of the hierarchy, especially places with well, seminarians and priests in France, and then extension to America. America really became a leader in that you know, traditional movement. Um, and then now we're kind of seeing it in the last, since the Dubia brothers came out, we're starting to see it even more. Any other examples that come to mind? Well, I just want to say I've always strongly felt since since the even before the time of the Dubia brothers, since 2014, 2015, since you had, say, Cardinal Burke and and others impel and them sending their little essays to all of the the Synod fathers in 2014 and the Vatican post office trying to gut it and, and they're having to sneak them. That was the first time I really looked at, at Akita. I was like, this must be what they're talking about. Mm-hmm. And all of the fallout from 2014. I mean, remember, let's do a little timeline. What was happening in 2014, you had the four Dubia brothers and Cardinal Kafaro would always mention these words, bishops against bishops and cardinals he against did. cardinals. He you, did. You remember I remember that. that. Yes. He was citing Akita. Yes. He's citing Akita and he's saying this is what's happening now. He received a personal letter in the 80s from Sister Lucy of Fatima, and she said, she told him something about bishops versus bishops. You know, yeah, everyone knows it by now. Um, and she also used the expression that, that the final, Satan's, Satan's final attack would come on the family. So that, 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 there's a lot of info packed into that bit of uh, that, that line. And so you combine those two facts that it's going to be a bitter struggle between bishops and their confreres and the idea that the struggle will come over the family. And then all of a sudden you have the synod on the family and a bitter struggle between a minority of good guys and what appears to be a majority of bad guys, ostensibly anyway. And I've always strongly said Akita in its third part. I think this is the key line for our times. Uh, really is talking about not not even Vatican II, but the the full instantiation, the full embodiment of Vatican II, which has begun in 2014, I'd say, the second year of the pan- Francis papacy. That's what I've always thought. Yeah. And last week when we did our video on the USCCB meeting, we were we were pointing out that there are bishops who are standing up and saying, why do you have a guy like James Martin going into your diocese. So we're seeing bishops starting to call each other out. It's it, In America, it's more subtle. It's not like Cardinal Kafara. But we're, I think we're starting to see it. And it'll be really interesting to see what USCCB meeting 2019 looks like if more yeah. bishops start to say, you know what? We got to start being apostolic. We got to start being vocal and explicit about what's wrong, not just making generalities. I mean, people out there who have watched these videos, everyone knows what I want, right? I want them being more than apostolic. I want them being prophetic. Mm. I want them standing and yelling if they need to do so at these meetings. Uh, right. You know, yelling, yeah, shouting, shouting the gospel against the walls, if that's what is required. Yeah. If- I, I was not, I mean, good for, good for all the bishops that said the right things, you know, earlier this week. But it's like there is a way of saying the right thing as as tep not tepidly, as gingerly as you can, you know. And so you're like, okay, this goes down on text. But I was basically whispering this. I feel like I strongly intuit that's what was happening. And even the words weren't that tough. So again, I'm not beggars can't be choosers. We'll take the heroes as they appear. But I'd like a more angry fashioning of of a of a hero that's gonna. I, I'd like a I mean, according to Akita, this is going to be a real conflict. I'd like it to get a little hotter, a, a bit hotter. Yes. I want the whole world ashamed of itself, which is, uh, you know, you, you got to have some profits if, yeah. if, if I'm to get what I want here. So, yeah, let's see it. Let's see yeah, what I was, you got. I was thinking, you know, if, when Cardinal Mahoney, the criminal, stands up in front of the USCCB and lectures everybody on abuse when he's paid out $720 million, I'm like, every one of you bishops has a crozier. That thing that somebody on, on the left side of the stage should have put that out and gone around his neck 
and drag right. them off like in the old comedies, right? I like you're it. a dud, dude. <laughs> we got yeah. our crook, yeah. and you, we're pulling you off the stage, but it didn't happen. Maybe next year it'll happen. Right. So Cardinals against Cardinals, Bishops against Bishops, and then she goes on to say, by the way, we have now moved beyond th- 3A, first part of the third secret of Fatima, and we're now getting into some teaching, and this is what I think 3B actually says. Thank this, you. Yeah, that's right? good you pointed that so out. So I think, you, I yeah. think if, if, if Akita, this third message of Akita, is the same as the third secret of Fatima, we are now getting into 3B, the text, yeah, yeah, the words right. of Our Lady at this point. We're, we're moving into the transition. She says, Exactly what I think. Yeah. The priests who venerate me will be scorned, scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromises, and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. That's the religious. The yep. thought of of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will be no longer pardon for them with courage. Speak to your superior. He will know how to encourage each one of you to pray and to accomplish works of reparation. I'll pause there. Churches and altars are going to be sacked and desecrated. There already had been right. There That's have been. I yeah. I mean, in, that. um, well, it, in uh, what was that in Italy? Was it Milan? It was Venice. I think it was Venice. This Muslim guy got up on the high altar and started dancing and break dancing. And his friend videoed it. You know, dope, yeah, crazy. Dude. In Ireland, there was a, a priest fornicating with another man. I think it was on an altar. I mean, really? So these things are happening. But I think this is not just talking about a handful of things. I think it's going to be systematic. Well, what I meant is y- y- you spoke with uh, Father Dwight. Uh, recently, right? Longenecker. Father yeah, Dwight Longenecker. Yeah. yeah. Um, and Father Father Longenecker wrote an amazing, amazing, but it's not even that long. He just had all the right pictures. And it was about pre, pre-VC2 altars and post-VC2 altars. And it was just a bunch of pictures. And then he had some really great one-liners in there right around 2015, right around the second synod. Um, and that I forget what the piece is called. I've looked it up recently. I can't remember it. It was just really good. I should email him. But um, that's the sacking. Sacking has this term too, right? The sacking of altar. It's like the, you know, the Colosseum was not originally known as a, a limestone structure, right? It was it was marble, and it was they pulled all of the finery off of it. That's the right. I, I think the primary meaning of sacking. So the altars had already been sacked by this 1973. I don't know if all around the world it was such a thorough thing, but now it's pretty much 99% of churches have none of the fine metals, none yes. of the hardware. Italy, uh, you've been to Italy a lot. You've been to Europe, Tim. I have too. You go into these amazing Romanesque, Baroque churches. The detail and the expense to put these churches and cathedrals together is unparalleled you walk in there the high altar is just you want to pass out and when they have right. some lame ikea particle wood altar yeah that's I positioned can't. 30 feet out from the high altar floating there in the transept and you're like we need to lynch somebody who, who put I, the ikea you, yeah. the, this this altar was was made out of <laughs> plywood or particle wood and it, it took one day to make and about six hundred dollars, and it's just junk. And you're, you're telling gonna, me that's not diabolical? What you're describing, it's bad. taking it's bad. putting junky IKEA furniture in the place of gold, gold hardware in the background. Yeah, that is the work of the devil. Who were these people? Sorry, baby boomers. Yeah, the people on watch during the seventies and eighties. What is the matter with you? All right, I had to get that out. But yeah, that's like yeah, on Thanksgiving. Someone. My wife, you know, puts out the fine china that we got for our wedding, and the silver, and the everything, the candlesticks, and everything like goes all out. She spends days getting all polishing the silver with the girls and all that. And then I come in for Thanksgiving and I say, "Oh wow, that's great," but we're not going to use that. She's like, what? Right. And like, yeah, I bought this um, card table from Home Depot, and right. we're just gonna we're gonna eat on that with paper with plates, Dixie cups, yeah. yeah, with paper plates and, and Dixie red cups. cups. Did, she, would did, she be offended? Yes. What do you mean? Like, should she be? Yeah. Yes. And why is she? Why is my wife doing all of that? Because she loves our family and she wants to celebrate it. 
She's thankful. It's Thanksgiving. Eucharistia. Thank you. Right. She's saying thank you to God. And when we say thank you to God, we try to give him our best. That's and right. that's what Catholics did for 2,000 years. They said, you know what? I'm going to take grandma's wedding ring and melt it down and give it to the church, you know? Or I'm going to go and, and volunteer and, and chisel, chisel marble, you know? Or, right. or, or donate marble or give our best so that for generations we have these glorious churches. And you go to Europe now and it's just sad. It's sad. That's a great analogy. Because people watching this think, oh, no one, no one would do this. You know, no one would actually come in with Dixie cups and paper plates say, this is what we're going to do. This is what they were doing in the 70s. And, and it had already yeah. done some before, before uh, uh, Akita. And what they did, I think, at an accelerating rate after Akita, they took all this beautiful, the, the beautiful altars, and they sacked them like a bunch of vandals and yes. Visigoths. It's disgusting. And again, shame on the people that sat by and saw this. Sorry. Shame on that generation. What is the matter with you? How could you watch? I'm this mad, and I'm mad hearing that once our churches didn't look like Applebee's, right? Yep. Most suburban churches are, are actually, no, no, I, I got it wrong. They're framed more like a macaroni grill, right? I, a lot of them have the flagstone and the set, that 70s look. I was like, wait, am I, am I waiting? Are you going to serve me like an appetizer if I'm <laughs> waiting here? Like, what do you, why does it look like this? And then that's just how it's been my whole life. I know. When I go to the Latin mass. But with the people, can you imagine how mad, and I get mad. Can you imagine if, if you had actually been 10, 20 years in the church with the beautiful just the real church. A lot of people were mad. A lot of people left. I know it's it's hard not to imagine myself being one of the people that I I, I'm glad, I'm glad that I was born a couple generations later because I get this mad over just looking back. How could you know? I don't know. I don't want to say something. Well, I mean, look at, look at, look what she says. She says churches and altars will be sacked. The very next line, the church will be full of those who accept compromises and there the demon, the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. Right. So yeah, you know, people either they accept compromise or just say, "I'm out. I'm not going to serve the Lord anymore." I'm. It's too crazy. I'm sick of company, and you know, man. You know, Tim. Since we've been doing these videos together, I've heard from a lot of priests, a lot of priests, and they're saying, "We priests, my brother priests, we talk. We are so discouraged right now. Really, we yeah. are so discouraged." And so I just want to ask all the, all the people out there, pray for our priests. You think yeah. us lay people were discouraged. I mean, these guys have given up and they've fought through some pretty crappy seminary situations to become ordained priests and to serve us and to serve the Lord. So pray for the priests and for all you father priests out there. We, we're praying for you. We love you. Keep fighting the fight. Keep fighting. Do not Keep let fighting. the demon depress many priests to leave the service of the Lord. Yeah, so. there, there's there's the there's a certain aesthetics about this, right? My, I mean, think of think of a really touching drama. I mean, why do we love Rocky One? It's one of one of the the Thanksgiving it's movies I always watch. It's, it's getting, getting deep. deep. We like <laughs> yeah. the cinema time. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean we like it because it's an underdog. Like that's what that's what the holy priests are. They're underdog fighters. Yes. Nothing is more inspiring to a man than an fight. underdog fighter. That doesn't care. It's like he's giving a, a middle finger to all the bad guys. And he's like, I don't care. Like you can, you know, all I want to do is go the distance. The famous Rocky thing. I just want to fight my fight. To use St. Paul's expression, I want to run my course. And you know what? Like you can, this is, this is, this is what I think about all of y'all. Like that's, that's what those pre, you need daily inspiration to do your job. And these, these priests need daily encouragement, not only from one another, but from the lay saying, Hey, that's great. Be angry. Fight. The angrier you are, the prouder we are. Preach it. That's, preach it. Pre preach yeah, it. preach it. Robert Bellarmine, man. Preach it. Righteous anger. Just do it. We need yeah. the righteous anger. We don't, we don't need to mince words. We don't have to say, well, I'm preaching this in charity. It's like, no, forget that. This is, there's, yeah. a, there's a time and a place for you all these things. You don't say this we're going to lead with beauty or all these things. No, just give no. it to us straight. Talk like yeah. Jesus. Talk like John the Baptist. So, and then she says, you know, the thought of so many soul, the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. So what does that mean? Loss. What loss is, what of souls. Mean? Loss of souls. But no, one, but no one goes to hell, I thought. Oh, yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. Well, dare we hope. 
Dare we hope? Dare we hope? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Balthazar, if it's garbage, it's garbage. Pure garbage. If you hear says priest, Mary. If you, yeah, says yeah. Mary. Uh, in Akita and in Fatima. If you hear priests saying that, don't listen to those priests. There, I said and it. Talk, and, and talk to them after Mass and yeah. be like, hey, hey, wrong guy. Uh, yeah. You ever heard of Akita or Fatima yeah. or the Gospels? Yeah, Dude, or the blessed. The answer is no, no, no. Blessed but, Virgin yeah. Mary. Yeah. Yeah. Or the Book of Revelation, which depicts people in hell. Right. Uh, so it's all there. Um, and this, this is kind of, you know, this is the closing part, Tim, um, yeah. where she says, uh, speak to your superior. Again, just like she said to Juan Diego, you know, go and talk to the bishop elect of Mexico City. Right. Go. We got we to gotta make this regular, you know. Just like she informed uh, Lucy at Fatima, she's like, yes. I don't want you revealing this to anyone except your bishop if you're sick or whatever, whatever the caveat was. She always says to operate. Now, this is, can we talk about this some? Yeah, I, I because, because the, the Sede Vacantis, they're not going to really jive with this. They're like, no. They reject. don't jive with it. And it, it's, it's difficult because like, when the message is that the majority of bishops will turn, right? There will be the devil will work into the church, the smoke of Satan, and will will convert, uh, I guess, a strong majority to the bad side. It's interesting. She calls it the demon. That is interesting. It's, it's kind of an interesting way of, of speaking there. Anyway, well, I wonder what that. I wonder why not. She doesn't say devil, Lucifer. Say, she says the demon. Right. The right. demon will be especially, especially implacable. So she's anyway, just interesting. Right. I, don't, I don't have anything to say about it. I just, it's noteworthy. It is noteworthy. But I mean, you, you see what I'm saying where it's like, I, it is, there is not, not to sound like a set a, uh, uh, far be it for me to sound like a set a, but it is interesting that there is, there's not a contradiction here, but there's a little bit of tension between, Hey, the hierarchy is going to get corrupted. But a and then a prime part of the message is and work within the hierarchical structure. Talk to uh, your superior. Talk to your superiors. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm again, I'm, I'm kind of connecting Akita and Fatima more, but it's like it is also interesting that whatever we think happened with three B and cover up, not cover up. What, what's a nicer word than cover up? Go find a euphemism. Somewhere. Mental reservation. <laughs> Mental reservation, uh, Antonio Sochi. Oh, we want to talk to you, Antonio Sochi. Yes. You're a good dude. But so all of all of this aside, she's saying work within the church, and it's kind of miraculous that the church approved both Akita and Fatima, isn't it? Given that it's like there is this tension. You're you're critiquing the hierarchy, and you're asking the hierarchy to ratify the document. That's because there's people in the hierarchy who realize that it is true. Yes. Like Ratzinger. Yes. They, they look around and they see churches sacked. They see altars sacked. They see uh, religious confused and discouraged and, de and despairing. And, you know, they say, yeah, well, we need to, we need to push this one through so people know. That's true. Hey, I, there's, one, should, there's one thing that came yeah. to mind real quick. We were talking about the, the sacking of churches and I lost the thought, but it just came back to me. Have yeah. you noticed when you were in, especially in Italy, I noticed it in Italy a lot. There's these altars, you know, these IKEA altars, and they don't put the candles on each end of the altar. They put them all, both on the one end of the altar. You notice this? Oh yeah, I did. They that's do. Funny. It drives me crazy. You know? Why did it's I'm so like, asymmetrical? Yeah, yeah. yeah they, that's... They, they put, and you see it sometimes in America. Probably priests who went to Europe and like, oh, that's cool. I should do that. But it's just you're in this church where everything is symmetrical and it's been designed that way, like a Platonic form, and then there's just this record screech right in the middle of the right the, the vision of it all of this ikea altar and then the candlesticks are like on one end of the altar together yeah and then it sometimes there's a plant on the other end it's like what who who is doing this i've never seen the plant but that's it's demonic that's genuinely funny no yeah, I, yeah. so we lived in san lorenzo which is the, the tiny tiny little neighborhood about a mile east of the coliseum and we were actually between the square formed by the corners of San Lorenzo, Santa Maria Maggiore. Uh, Santa Croce was really close. It was actually even closer than San Lorenzo. I like that, that church. Yeah. I, that's my favorite church. Is that your favorite? Uh, yeah, I like that's it. That's my favorite. And, I, and then um, San Giovanni, which it faces the church is built by Constantine and his mother. I trained for the Rome Marathon. I ran that ovular park between Sweet. San Giovanni and Santa Croce. It was dope. 
But um, the Muslims. I, I would ran the Gelato Cup. To... Did you? You know what the Gelato Cup is? No, I don't. So we what would, is? My son and I did it with seminary American seminarians. So around Vatican City is, I think it's a little over two miles. That's and it's uphill nice. one side, downhill the other side. And you run around a nation because Vatican City State is a nation. That's hilarious. And whoever yeah. wins it gets a giant cup full of gelato just down the street at, at Old Bridge. I, so, an Irish priest told me about it, but I, he, yeah. he just said that he was running and it. And some people and who are joggers, when they're in Rome, they'll go and run around Vatican City just to say, I ran around a country. That's so, funny. So we run it, and um, I never won it. My son yeah. got pretty close. He's a pretty fast runner, but some of the seminarians were in good shape, good runners. But So I can't claim the, the Rome Marathon, just the... Gelato, gelato cut around the walls, gelato, gelato City, marathon. around the walls of Vatican City because Vatican City doesn't have walls. That's right, 20, 21 feet. Yeah, big uh, walls. Yeah, but uh, yeah, no. So it, it, anyway, yeah, I only would ever see the off-centered, one-sided candle at our little local parish. But usually, we went to either Santa Croce, San Lorenzo, San. What Maria. was the local parish that you would go to? I forget. It was literally just around. We were lucky enough to live almost right above like a smallish American style grocery, which was just mm. sheer good luck because we didn't want to like shop seven times a week like the Romans. Um, so and, and right behind that was just a little parish and it was literally all like 80 year olds and above. And they thought we were they thought it was so neat to have two like Bambini, you know, two mm -hmm. middle 20s two middle twenties aged uh, couple that was married, married in their twenties. They'd call when Steph got pregnant um, out there with our first uh, daughter, they would call her a ragazza madre, like a child mother. It's like, she's like, you know, <laughs> middle twenties and they, the, the, the arrested development is staggering. But yeah, it's sad. yeah. So I only said you, you just reminded me of something I hadn't thought of in a long time. I've never seen that in America, by the way. Of what? What? The, the, the off the standard I've seen candle. It. I've seen it. It's I mean, very rare, but I've seen it here. But it's I a poser see it priest. Every, yeah, yeah, there's some guy, some monsignor went to Italy and got a good idea by seeing it. But in Italy, yeah, it's all over the place. It's like it the, the trendy thing to do since 1989 is to put the candles on one end. Everyone out there in the comments, if you've seen this, just let me know. I think it's an interesting phenomenon. I'm trying to figure out who thought of this. As it's asymmetry. So weird. It's so yeah. weird. So yeah. okay, well, let's just finish up the. Unless you got something more to say about candle. Okay. Um, so he says, uh, it is Bishop Ito who directs your community. So again, we're, we're talking about a bishop here. You have, some, you have still something to ask. Today is the last time that I will speak to you in a living voice. From now on, you will obey the one sent to you and your superior. Pray very much the prayers of the rosary. I alone am able to save you from the calamities this which approach. Those who place their confidence in me will be saved. End quote. End of Our Lady of Akita. So just a really sweet uh, admonition to be faithful to your superior and your bishop. Right. Right. Which is not always the, the sound like the takeaway of what we're saying here, but, but it is. It actually is. Uh, working it out is a little bit uh, complex, and that's why we have hour and a half shows. But it is. Right. We, we still work as lay parish priests still work as, as ordained men within a hierarchical structure. We're not Marxists. We're not advocating getting rid of the hierarchy. We want to prop up and dignify, yeah. redignify the hierarchy, make the church holy again. Yes. Make the church holy again. Got to get those hats. Who wants to make right. the church holy again hat? Can make I think it'd be dope. It'd yeah. Be great. It'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there it is. Our lady of, Akita, if you have any uh, suggestions for future shows, let us know in the comments. And of course, as we always say, please like this video. Why like it? Because if you like it, that tells the YouTube robots to share this video around on YouTube and more people will see it. So if you want more people to see this, go ahead and hit like. Also, you can hit the share button and share it on Facebook. You can uh, text it to someone else. Just let other people know about it because a lot of people are confused. And they need some direction. They need to know what the words of Our Lady are, Akita, Fatima, and everything going on in the church. So please like it, share it, subscribe to the channel, and hit the little bell. That'll notify you every time we have a new video out. And uh, thanks for watching. God bless you. And we will always say, pray the rosary. Daily. Let it be known.
that Tim and Taylor say, pray the rosary. It is the weapon for our time. It is the gospel on beads. It is meditating on the gospels of Jesus Christ. The birth, the life, the death, the resurrection, the glorious ministry of Jesus Christ. All right. God bless everyone. See you in the next video.